Hello and welcome to this World 101X live stream. Now, we're here with a whole panel to answer some of your questions. Now, we've already received a couple of questions through the discussion forum, but if you have questions right here, right now, put them through on the YouTube or on Facebook or on Twitter, and Carrie will put them up for us and we'll ask those questions to the panel live for you. Now, before we start, let me introduce the panel. I'm Gerhard Hofstede. I'm the course director for World 1X. But on the panel today, we have some of familiar faces, familiar to you from previous episodes. We've got uh, Associate Professor Annie Ross um, from Episode 3, uh, who's worked in the Solomon Islands and in Queensland with indigenous issues around food security, a whole range of issues. Um, we've got Dr. Richard Martin, who's an anthropologist and a consultant anthropologist also, um, who you'll know from Episode 4 uh, in the field with David Trigger and Richard Martin up in the Gulf. Um, talking to Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people in that area of Australia. And you'll also know Amelia Radke, a PhD student in anthropology here at UQ, who is also one of the course moderators. And she works uh, in anthropology and the law uh, here in Brisbane. So eager to, to get their views on some of the questions that have come through already. And I think we'll get started with the first one right now. The first question is from Rona. And Rona asks, to what degree do regional differences exist in Australia between indigenous people and settler populations? And I think one of the first questions really is, what is settler, a settler society? And we'll, we'll come to that in a second. Um, she goes on to say, I noticed from the demographic map provided for different cities that each city had its own unique immigrant populations and in different percentages. Do these different immigrant slash settler populations influence the type of relationships which exist today? So really it's a question about are there differences from place to place in how relationships between indigenous and non-indigenous people uh, come about? So maybe, um, maybe let's start with you, Richard. Um, first of all, settler society, what is it? Uh, great, thanks, Gerhard. Uh, well, I think about settler societies as... Um, societies that have gone through this experience of, of colonisation, uh, but particularly places where the settlers, I guess, came to stay. So um, places where people, like Australia, where people came from Europe and England and elsewhere and made their homes here and um, a process which poses all sorts of questions about relationships with the land and with people who were here before, indigenous people, and um, the, you get this sort of dynamic kind of uh, interface of cultures and histories and perceptions and relationships, uh, which is also a, can be a very troubling history and so on. And, um, and, and in your experience, you work in, in the Gulf, which is quite a remote area uh, of Australia. What's the relationship like there between indigenous and, and non-indigenous people? Yeah, so out in the bush in the Gulf country where, um, where I've been working for about 10 years, um, you have an interesting dynamic of, of, of particularly a lot of pastoral families who've been in that area for, for you know, the better part of 150 years. So multiple generations growing up in the same areas of non-indigenous people and then you have a large population of Aboriginal people who, for whom that area has been their home for many thousands of years, going back tens of thousands of years in that area. Um, and then interestingly, um, in the north of Australia generally, um, but particularly around the coastline, um, places like Broome in Western Australia and and the Torres Strait, but also in the Gulf Country, we had these large populations of Chinese people and Afghan people coming through in the 19th century. And um, the start of the 20th century, it became much more difficult for them to move around. But um, so there's these legacy populations of, of Chinese people, particularly men who then settled down with Aboriginal women um, and produced mixed descent offspring who form a kind of, uh, uh, you know, have, have their own kind of complicated histories um, in relation to that experience of settlement and colonisation in Australia, which are a little bit different uh, to, to the kind of dynamic we think of of white people and 
you know, Aboriginal people. We've got this whole other dynamic um, of Chinese people and people from other parts of Asia, which, which is kind of a different way to think about Australian history and relationships and so on. I think that's an interesting point about the diversity within both the settler population but also the Aboriginal populations, that there's a huge diversity that then brings about different kinds of relationships at different points in time and, and different areas. What's, what's been your experience, Annie? Well, I think one of the things that's really, really important is that Aboriginal people are not one group of people. They're not one cultural group because different Aboriginal people believe different things. As, as I'm sure you know that you'll work with one community and for them a creator being is the rainbow serpent with a different community. The creator being is, is Biome. Um, and the rainbow serpent does one set of things and Biome does a completely different set of things. And so people have to respond to these creator beings in different ways and so they have different laws about the way in which you have to deal with different aspects of country. So that means that people have different ways of relating to country, different ways of connecting to country. But even so, there are some similarities um, that cut right across. So the way people connect to country being very important is, is one of the commonalities right across, uh, right across Australia. And I think when you're dealing with settler relationships with Indigenous people, it's easier for settlers to deal with those commonalities than it is to deal with the differences because people then, they, they sort of create stereotypes and I guess I'm stereotyping by saying that settlers create stereotypes but there do tend to be these sorts of stereotypes that get created and when um, settlers travel and meet different Indigenous groups and they expect them to be the same as that group elsewhere and then there's always the assumption, oh well then they... Th these aren't the real Aboriginal people. And that's when you get um, people saying things like, well, it's only the remote Aboriginal people mm -hmm. who are the real Aboriginal people. Those people who live in the cities have lost their culture. Uh, and I'm sure, Amelia, you find that very much when you're dealing with Brisbane blacks. There's this sense that um, Aboriginal people have lost their culture just because their culture today is being expressed in a very different way because often Aboriginal people who live in cities have to walk between two paradigms. You know, they, they, they've been to school, um, many of them have been to university and they have university degrees, they drive cars like you and I do, they, they live in houses like you and I do, um, and, and then others say, well, then they can't be real Aboriginal people because they're not practising their culture. But... People do still practice their culture. Living culture is a really important component of Aboriginal cultural heritage, but it's practiced in a variety of different ways. Mm. What a great segue to, to you and your work here in, in Brisbane, a, a major metropolitan area. Yeah. Um, can, can you say a bit about what your experience has been here? Yeah, so uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here in Brisbane... Um, there's many, many communities. It's, it's a very, and each community is very diverse. It's very culturally diverse. Um, but there's many communities. And also, the urban remote divide I find particularly problematic because people move. Like, people go back to country if their country is not Brisbane. And some people have Brisbane as their country or this area as their country. So um, I think it's a problematic economy that exists because it just doesn't reflect the reality of many people who I work with in the courts and with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here in Brisbane and other cities. And I guess one, one issue that we, we've, we've gone back into stereotyping a little bit in terms of partly because we have to when we talk about specific kind of people but actually as you said there's a lot of diversity in um, mixed, you know, being of mixed descent, um, that's both for Aboriginal but also for settler populations. So, and it's not just between, you know, mixing between settler and, and Indigenous, but also in between those different communities. And speaking of a community, we're already mm -hmm. placing a kind of um, fence around, or mm -hmm. here are some characteristics of a community, whereas it's become very, very porous, as we all know. And, and today, you know, with travel across the world and migration, it's become even more porous, and that, that idea of communities has become quite challenged. So, um, Rona, I think we, we've talked about some of the issues, but actually there's another question that relates to this issue of settler 
and non-settler um, identities. And it's from Michelle. And Michelle asks, I remember someone mentioning that either New Zealand or Indonesia had a non-settler society in contrast to Australia being a settler society. Could you please outline the differences and its effect on the definition of indigeneity? I think we, we talked about it before already, and I think you, you had a point to make about New Zealand. Sure. Well, I guess, I mean, when I think about settler societies, I think about places where people, people came to stay and make their homes as against like a colonial setting like Afghanistan or, um, you know, Ethiopia, where people occupied the area and, and set up relations of extraction, uh, which, you know, went where wealth went elsewhere, but didn't really settle there or, or seek to make it their home. And if you think about a place like Australia, you have the majority population, the vast majority of the population who came from overseas and then settled here and made the modern society. So I think there's an interesting conceptual question for us uh, in thinking about settlement and colonialism of how we see that process and, and, and you know, is there a point at which Australia or, or New Zealand or the United States or Canada uh, cease being settler societies and become, what do we call them, post-settler societies or... or um, you know, how do we see that process playing out into the future? Which makes us think about relationships again. I think, I think it also helps to raise that question of, you know, what do we mean by indigeneity? Because mm. there are many settlers in Australia and in North America and in New Zealand um, who see themselves now as indigenous, as being the people of this country, the people of the land. And they no longer see themselves as settlers. And... Th particularly, again, here I'm going to start essentialising, but there are farmers who would argue that they have as strong an attachment to their mm. land as Indigenous people do, as Aboriginal people do. And so they argue that they're no longer settlers, they are Indigenous. Their perception of themselves is that they are Indigenous. Whereas Aboriginal Australians, or Maori in, in New Zealand or, or Native Americans in North America, well may say, you might see yourselves as Indigenous, but we still see you as invaders, those coming from outside and taking our land and settling on our land and doing things with the land that we no longer agree with. So I think there is quite a bit of tension in settler societies between those people who see themselves as post-settler and Indigenous and those others who st still see the settlers as settlers, invaders. So mm. I, think, I, th I think these are really interesting issues about you know, how people see themselves and how others see them. Yeah, and I think the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People has played a role in kind of um, making this a really dynamic and complex issue because their definition of who is Indigenous may not actually suit every single country in the world. So... Um, understanding how locally people understand indigeneity I think is really important when it comes to like macro issues of the UN declaration kind of thing. I think it's an interesting point and it brings to the fore the role of anthropology in some respect in terms of interrogating the history mm. and the particularities of a, a particular place that we're studying mm. but also the impact of politics, the law mm. and I think the law at every level uh, could be indigenous law, could be international law, could be national law local laws in shaping and forming some of these identities, be they indigenous or non-indigenous. Just to mention Indonesia, and um, kind of the same is true of Malaysia, where there's this debate is playing out where, um, I don't know about Indonesia, I know Malaysia has signed up to the declaration, um, and they have uh, the majority in Malaysia is what's called the Bumiputra, the sons of the soil, so they have that clear link. Um, but there's also the Orang Asli, the, the actual indigenous people, um, and when the government had signed up, they, they said, well, we signed up for the Bumiputra. We didn't really sign up for the Orang Asli, right? Because in our definition, we, the majority, are the indigenous people. And the other indigenous people, well, we're, we're looking after them, but they're not indigenous in the same way. And I think that's where the, the legalistic becomes moderated by politics mm -hmm. and, and real politics mm -hmm. often. And it's similar in Indonesia, where the Indonesians have actually come out and said, there are no indigenous people here.
Um, or we're all indigenous. Or we're all yeah. indigenous. So yeah. that, that kind of um, dynamic. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. We might come back to some of those issues about defining uh, indigeneity. Uh, now to a very different question. Now, I don't remember who posed it, but um, one of our students asked, for people who believe that objects are temporary, while people's souls are not, how do they relate to the objects around them? So this is a, a material culture question um, in some respects. So is it in a different, perhaps shallower way than the people uh, or groups of people who believe that things they live and use will outdate them by decades or even centuries? So how, how do people relate to things in a way? Um, part of the question also, it, for me, is interesting. It, 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 it already brings a lot of cultural baggage to the question in terms of saying that there are people's souls and that these souls outlast things. So there's already uh, a loaded, a, it's a loaded question in some respects. Mm -hmm. But I think it's an interesting issue. Uh, and I know you've done some work in the Solomons that deals with some of those relationships. Yes, definitely. And I, look, I, I thought this was a really interesting question. For me, it triggered um, thoughts relating to the social life of things. We all know, for example, when you've got an assignment due and um, it's about to be printed out and the printer breaks down because the printer is, is, is occupied by a spirit being that knows when you're in a rush and it deliberately, it's completely malevolent, the, 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 the spirit in your printer, and it always breaks down when you're in a rush to get something printed out at the last minute. So we all know that objects have social lives. In the society that I uh, work in, in the Solomons, it's in the western province of Solomon Islands, um, and particularly around um, a place called Marova Lagoon. And the people of Marova Lagoon were headhunters par excellence in the um, 17th, 18th and 19th centuries, and even actually into the 20th century. And headhunting comes with a whole range of accoutrements. You have the, the big war canoe. Um, the war canoes are, are paddled, so you, you have the paddles. Um, the warriors carry shields and, and tomahawks and spears. The canoes themselves have a whole series of, of symbolic uh, carvings or um, other symbolic elements, some of them are made of shell, that are there to protect the oarsmen and the warriors in, in the canoes. In pre-contact times, most of these objects were very short-term. They were designed to last that journey. So a war canoe can take a year to make, and it was designed to last one journey. It would effectively fall apart by the time you got it back home. It was just designed to last you long enough to get out and back. On the prow and stern of the war canoe are two uh, highly important symbolic elements. The totu isu, sometimes called a nuzul nuzul, on the front, and the chikubiru on the back of the war canoe. And these two beings, these spirit beings, are on the canoe with the totu isu being the offensive line and the chikubiru being the defensive line. And the job of these two carvings, sail right down at water level, was to keep an eye out for um, enemies from the front, enemies from behind, but to also protect people from the spirit beings in the sea, the tamasa, who could actually come up out of the sea and jump into the boat and, and, and kill people. The, the lead tamasa is the shark. And so these, these objects are designed to protect people, but they have a very short lifespan. Again, they're designed to last that particular journey. And in our anthropology museum, we have some totu isu and some chikubiru mm. from the 19th century, and they're beautiful, but they're in what we would call poor condition because they've, they've had their life. Their life is over. People today continue to make totu isu and chikubiru, which they sell to tourists. And the objects that are sold to tourists are beautifully made. They're made out of much more solid timber than the traditional, whatever traditional means, the traditional totu isu and chikubiru. Um, they're inlaid, so they're beautiful. They've got shell. Um, they're polished within an inch of their life. They've got 
um, polish on them, they've been sanded back. And these objects are designed to have a really long life. They're designed to be sold to tourists and then to be kept on a shelf and, and admired uh, by tourists. But the spirit of these beings, of course, continues on. And so the spirit of the Toto Isu enters every object and every object then it has its own soul, I guess, if you, if you were to say that. So, so Even the ones produced for tourists? Yeah, even the ones produced for tourists have story. And, and the people who make them will be really proud of them. And, you know, they'll tell you how long it took them to make. And, they'll, and you know, while they're making it, they'll, they'll explain, you know, what they're doing and, and why that's important and why I chose to make it out of this particular timber because I wanted it to last and I wanted the purchaser to be proud of it and to admire it. And then they tell the story to the purchaser so that that, that object is still imbued with, with the story, with the narrative, with the spirit. And so this narrative continues through the object. So, so people might have souls, but I think sometimes objects also have souls or spirits or narratives. So perhaps... You know, this, this, this question's an interesting one because um, it may not just be people's souls that have um, an ongoing life, but perhaps mm -hmm. those things also do so. Well, I have a different uh, sort of take on this. I saw The Rock, the Hollywood actor, on Instagram uh, after he'd been announced as the richest, highest paid actor in the world. 65 million dollars last year and he was in the gym and he was saying thank you to all my fans for supporting me and getting me here and you know I've worked hard for it and and I'm happy with my success and then he said but you know if you took away all of my success you know I'd still be here I wouldn't like it but I'd still be here I'd still be getting up early and hitting the gym and and so on I'd still be the same and I think uh we have a way of thinking about objects and things as external to our identities and our lives. And I think The Rock, in his own way, was expressing that, that he's produced this, this body out of his hard work, which, which goes out into the world sort of separate, in a way, from, from anything that else that he might have accumulated. And I think anthropology kind of encourages us to see objects and relations with objects as partly constitutive of our social worlds and identities and so on. And I suspect that if The Rock was stripped of his, of his incredible wealth and success, you know, it, it would actually, ch it changes the person and it, you know, it's an obvious thing to say. But I think the sense that we have that that we're totally separate from the world and we go out and earn our success and build our bodies in the gym or whatever we may do. I think it's yeah, anthropology encourages us to think a little bit beyond that in places like the Solomons, but also in the gyms of Los Angeles and so on. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, and I find also, like I also work in the Anthropology Museum here at the University of Queensland, and yeah, you, we often have exhibitions where uh, Aboriginal elders and respected persons will come in and be like, oh, this means this. And we'll take it on and we'll be like, yep, yeah, okay, well, we now have all this great information about the object or um, that's on display that means something to them. So I think objects can change depending, like their meaning can change depending on who's looking at it, like their gaze. Mm. And I think in, in, in your example, there's also a little bit of, uh, of change in terms of the functionality mm. of the object that then determines what the object may be made out of, but also part of the, the spirit. Um, it's probably much more important in a, if you're going on a, a walk canoe out in the sea that everything's been done right mm. <laughs> than if you're selling it to a oh, tourist. Oh, much more perhaps. important. <laughs> much more important. Yes, definitely. Um, but again, that talks, about, talks to the embodiment, too, mm. of, of objects or the relationship um, that we have with certain objects. And I wonder if, if part of the question also comes from a point where in, in Western societies we have a throwaway culture where many objects, everyday objects that we use, if they break, we throw them away. 
we use a lot of things that have a very, very short lifespan, much, much shorter mm. than a walk canoe. Yes, um, yes. You know, half a day, less than that. A, a, mm. a coffee cup, we drink it and it gets thrown out. Um, and, and that has created a sense for some people of a bifurcation between objects and the body and the, the human and something that is much more than things we throw away. Mm. Um, but an interesting, interesting set of ideas mm. around objects um, and people. Mm. Um, and sometimes, of course, objects can become, can be people. Or people can become objects, <laughs> like the rock. <laughs> Indeed. So, and again, I think that's interesting from, uh, from anthropology. One of the lines we always have is, you know, oh, it's more complex than that. And in a way, everything is everything. And we can, we very porous, right, in how yeah. we, we talk about mm. uh, the world around us. Um, but one, one other thing this question uh, raised is the issue of cultural relativism in terms of um, how we approach other cultures. And I was just interested if you have a, a, a short vignette or a story about, in your own fieldwork, where cultural relativism um, became very problematic, um, where the, uh, the other cultures' norms um, couldn't be accepted as other, but where you had to become involved, perhaps, in some way um, in, in your field. Does anybody have a...? Um, yeah, I'll go. Um, <laughs> go for it. I don't really find... Like, I find that when I work in the courts, because it's a legal system, uh, I work in the Murray Court, um, it's usually a negotiated, negotiated outside of court proceedings. It's never ever done in the public sphere. It's done in a private. Um, but yeah, it's just, I think it's negotiated, but I've never had an issue where, like people often always assume that there's issues going to be around customary law or spearing or really romantic notions, but I've never actually had that issue. <laughs> like, um, I've never had that issue come up of people saying, oh, like really romantic, kind of stereotypical images. And I guess, and a clash, a perceived clash, right? That yeah, Aboriginal law, or, um, Indigenous law versus Western law. Or yeah, because like in the Murray Court, the white legal system, if you like to call it that, and uh, community justice group members, elders and respected persons are coming together to help this issue of overrepresentation of Indigenous people in, in incarceration. Um, so yeah, it's about highlighting, you know, recognising difference and mm -hmm. letting it come to light. I think I've had an experience that, that might be illustrative of what you're talking about. When I first came to Brisbane, I met an Aboriginal man who invited me over to North Stradbroke Island. And as we were going for a little bit of a walk around, he told me four things. He told me that Aboriginal people can make it rain or stop raining. They're used to be killer whales living in Moreton Bay. There were crocodiles in the Brisbane River and there's a large uh, creator being in one of the lakes on North Stradbroke Island. And of course I didn't believe him on any of those points. I was very polite and said, oh yes, yeah, we're fine and good anthropologist. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to say what my own views are, but deep down I was saying, you know, don't believe any of this. Only a few months later, I was visiting with another Aboriginal group in the Northern Territory, and they were putting on this performance, and everybody was, was, was painted up, and it began to rain, and so everybody's paint began to run. And one of the old men went off to the side, muttered a few words, threw his hands in the air, and it stopped raining. And I said, blow me down. He's made it stop raining. Not long after that, there was a program on the ABC about whaling in Moreton Bay and about the killer whales that used to come into Moreton Bay chasing the whales. Well, that was the second thing. And then a, a year or so later, um, this same Aboriginal man and, and, and some of his colleagues and I were all going through some old archival documents and there was a newspaper cutting with the picture of this most enormous crocodile from the Logan River. So that was three where I'd been called so, large creator being in one of the lakes on North Stradbroke Island, no problem. Happy to believe it now. <laughs> and, you know, I, I just think that, you know, sometimes, you know, when, when we're trained in, in a very Western way, in a very scientific way, and you need proof for everything, 
Um, when people tell you things that are not part of our logic, it's really hard to accept it. But of course, faith of any kind is not logical. It's the whole point of faith and belief. And you can't bring your own cultural logic to somebody else's cultural expression. And that's something I learnt very, very strongly in my first few years working with the Aboriginal people on North Stradbroke Island. And there are all sorts of other things that I've since learnt, which I find challenging because of my own belief system coming up, being brought up through a Western scientific trained system. But I no longer pass judgment on other people's cultural ways because my logic is irrelevant. But I think it also highlights the, this negotiated space mm. um, or interstitial space that anthropologists mm. inhabit where we're sometimes at odds with our own logics, our own worldview, mm. but we're negotiating that with whatever we're learning from another point of view. And we're creating this new space, this, this in-between space, and then try to write or, or, or talk mm. about that to other people. Uh, in my own work in, in Malaysia, it actually also came out in the law, mm. um, particularly around Islamic law, where as a Western trained person, there was um, a dispute between people who were defending freedom of religion and people who saw that as an attack to their religion, the mere defense of freedom of religion. And as a Western trained person, I was immediately drawn to the side that was you know, supporting freedom of religion. Um, but once I talked to the people who were demonstrating uh, at a particular uh, place where they, they held a seminar, um, saying, you know, this is a, a direct attack on everything I believe by people espousing even freedom of religion. And so I, I got talking to him, and that, as in your experience, uh, the, the key thing for anthropologists is really to not be closed off, mm. to actually approach any issue and embrace and, and query um, and talk to and engage mm. that other worldview, that other logic, that other way of being. And that takes time, and it's, it's, it's challenging, and sometimes we might come mm. out of it not agreeing with everything, but I think it's that process that's really important in, in the anthropology that we do. Well, and that can be the problem for anthropology, because you, you're encouraged to, to like, you, I, I guess you go into anthropology often because there's something you don't understand, and you're like, well, how can I come to understand it? And you research it, and you find out about difference and, and the way that people think differently about the world, even perceive the world very differently. And I think that kind of methodology or methodological cultural relativism is, is I mean, it's what gives us our signature insights, ideally into global issues. But the issue is, I guess, then when you are researching a setting where there are pathologies involved and... Um, whether anthropology blinds itself potentially to to serious social issues in seeing them as um, difference or in interpreting them as culture um, rather than you know taking a more uh, moral stand on issues like you know child abuse and neglect, which in Australia uh, in the context of of the Northern Territory National Emergency Response or Intervention um, into Indigenous communities where there were seen to be those issues, it really convulsed Australian anthropology and academics were, were accused and, and accused each other and questioned themselves as to whether they had blinded themselves to these issues or whether they'd done justice and, and appropriate speaking of truth um, about some of the problems in our field settings as well as some of the beauties and some of the, the charismatic differences. I think that that's also brought up when you're looking at significance assessment in cultural heritage management. Um, it, Can you, you just explain briefly what yeah, so, that entails so, and what so, you're doing there? So cultural heritage management is, is where um, it, it's usually in situations where there's a developer who wants to alter the land in some way and in the process will um, destroy or at least damage uh, mm -hmm. a place of great significance 
um, from an archaeological perspective, it might be an archaeological site. From an Aboriginal perspective, it might be a place of great significance. And so in, to, to make a decision about whether or not you're going to recommend that the development proceed as, as designed or whether it needs modification or whether it needs to be stopped altogether, you have to assess the significance of the cultural heritage. And, you know, sometimes you go out in the field with Aboriginal people, and, and I've actually heard people do this. They, they'll put their hand on a tree and they'll say, this tree is really significant to me, I can feel the vibes. Well, sorry, folks, that's not good enough. Just because an Aboriginal person says, that tree is significant, I can feel the vibes, it's not going to stand up in court. And I think as, as anthropologists and cultural heritage managers, we need to have a good BS radar basically. And if somebody is, is, is making claims that have absolutely no basis whatsoever, I'm not prepared to believe them. Mm. If somebody were to come to me though and say, see this tree here, it's got native bees, I can see the native bees flying around here. My totem, my yuri, is the native bees. These are my ancestors. My ancestors take the form of native bees and they bring me messages. So this tree with the native bees nest um, is an old tree that's associated with my ancestors through the connection with the native bees. And as you can see, all over here, near the tree, there are stone artefacts scattered. So this tree and the stone artefacts scatter and the native bees all come together to make a place of great significance to me. Then that's something that I will accept because here we have a set of arguments that will stand up in court that, will, that can go into a report that makes sense. Now, is that me bringing my own cultural relativism to say to them, we're operating now in a Western legal system just because you say that's a site, I can't accept that. You give me some logical reason why that's a site, then I can write about it. And this is one of the things that I think conflicts cultural heritage managers all the time. Because we have to operate in this Western mm. system. Because you can't write a report that says every tree over here is significant because some Aboriginal elder feels the vibes. Because it just won't stand up in court. And we have to be logical about the way we approach these kinds of things. It doesn't mean that the person who said, because I feel the vibes, it's not significant, but I need more than that if I'm acting as a cultural heritage manager, to make the case for why this place needs to be protected against development. Hmm. Do you if, find the same thing, Richard? Well, I guess that what, what one of the things we're talking about is, like, what is anthropology? Like, is anthropology the collection and recording of cultural exotica from around the world, which is then sort of sent out into the marketplace to be consumed by people from other parts of the world as interest in cultural diversity. And yeah, maybe it is. I mean, maybe that's part of what we do. But I guess anthropology is also the kind of analysis and comparison that we then bring to these kinds of cultural differences that we locate around the world. And in that analysis, there are all sorts of interesting conceptual challenges and questions. And you've sort of broached the issue of of in a settler society like Australia, anthropology and applied anthropology mm. and cultural heritage management um, in its interaction with the law, there's all sorts of um, you know, obvious challenges for anthropology in that space. Is it an instrument of the law and of the settler colonial recognition of indigenous difference? Does it play a role in structuring and translating and accommodating that difference within the sort of settler society? Or is there a kind of role for anthropology in sort of challenging those structures as well and, um, and, and taking that difference and our own analysis to build a kind of um, comparison and a, and a kind of dynamism um, that's good to think with. Mm. But I think it also highlights issues around, um, like the legal system is just as much a social institution. It has rituals, it has its own language. I remember when I first started going into the court proceedings, I, I spent most of the proceedings just confused because I didn't understand the language. I didn't understand the rituals. I didn't understand why I had to bow 
when I walked into the court, when I left, I just didn't understand it. So, yeah, I think the legal system, like, also is very much a social institution. Understanding that culture. Mm -hmm. I think in in the discussion forum, one thing that there was a heated debate, not just in the anthropology, but actually also in our discussion forum, around the role of the anthropologist. Mm -hmm. Is it the role of the anthropologist to be an activist for the people we work with? Is the role of the anthropologist to be, you know, an instrument of government or the court system or a developer, whatever, whatever it may be, um, or, or to be as objective as possible as an observer and only record, uh, take down notes of what he or she can see uh, around them? And there's been some... Uh, consternation, I think, because anthropology doesn't have an answer to this. <laughs> it is an ongoing debate within the discipline, uh, and there are different camps, um, as you've alluded to, in, in Australia but around the world, um, who either engage public anthropology, engaged anthropology, activist anthropology, militant anthropology. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole range of anthropologies and positions as anthropologists we can take. Um, in your own work, you've, you've, you've talked about some of those, those, those challenges and issues. How, how do you see yourself? What kind of, you know, what, what qualifying word before the anthropologist do, do you, would you put? I think, I think anthropologists wear lots of different hats. And I think a lot depends on what hat you're wearing. Mm. So I remember one time I was asked to investigate a claim by Aboriginal women that a particular physical archaeological place was a women's site. And when I went to speak with the women, and I knew this was going to end up in court, so I, I was actually went in wearing two hats. The first hat was, what's the basis of the Aboriginal claims that this is indeed a women's place? And when I first began talking to the women, there were people I'd never met before, so there was no trust relationship between us. So the first thing I had to do was to talk to the women and find out what they believed about this place and then to be really honest with them and say well okay if I've got to take this to court the court is not going to accept those statements that you're making I need something else I need something that has um, a, a, that has a lot more narrative associated with it and over time I spent as long as I could with them was about a week as the week went on I began to learn more and more about this place, not just about the archaeological site, but about the place as a whole. And the narratives began to come out. And as the narratives came out, I was able to say, look, these are narratives that will actually make sense in a court. These are the narratives that we need to build on. And so then I went from being someone who was trying to elicit information and very specific information that I knew would work in a legal circumstance to um, trying to understand the narrative, trying to understand the concepts that people were bringing together. And although they were all challenging concepts because they were about created beings that, that, that I didn't personally have as part of my culture, but they were created beings that I knew about and so I knew that these were not being you know, made up or, or, or in any way mischievous. Uh, that these were indeed important creator beings. And as the narratives evolved, I was able to take those narratives and almost become an advocate, saying, OK, now in my report, I can write this up in this way. And it did end up going to court, and the court did find in favour of the Aboriginal views. Um, and interestingly, the Aboriginal views that were used in court were the views that came through in this more nuanced narrative that came out over time and not so much in these very bland and rather superficial statements that I was first given. So I guess, you know, as, as your hats change, your mm. role changes. So I first started off purely trying to document as objectively as I could to becoming more involved with that um, community. And now I've, I've become very, I've become best friends with with one of the women, I see her a lot. We're actually running a conference together. We're running a session together. We're going to give a paper together. So, you know, we've gone from being, you know, just anthropologists and subject to being colleagues and friends. Um, and so we've, so, so, so that whole relationship has changed and until finally in the court circumstance, becoming an advocate. So, yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's seductive for anthropologists. Um, you know, you like I grew up in Sydney in the city, and then you, uh, you know, I was interested in going out in the bush, and you go out in the bush, and you have all sorts of exciting experiences and close friendships and collaborations with indigenous people, also pastoralists and settlers and so on. And I used to joke with my friend who was doing a PhD in another part of Australia about what would happen to us, you know, when we do these PhDs. And, and you know, she would say, oh, well, you know, they'll say we showed promise, but the last we saw of them, uh, you know, they were living in a tent out in the bush with a whole bunch of kids and so on. And because it's very tempting to, to cross over, you know, you're interested in these other cultures. There was a French researcher who, who studied boxing and he trained as a boxer. And, um, and then he did a fight. And, and he, he writes in his, in his ethnography that, you know, I, I really thought about becoming a semi-professional boxer. And the, I guess when you do that, when you step over and then you don't come back, you cease to be the anthropologist and you become something else, which may be very valuable as well. But for me, the anthropology is, is coming back and then, and then what do you do next? And I think if anybody can answer that question, they should write in. <laughs> well, a question has just come in that's actually really related to this uh, from Nabeen Kumar. And he asks, what brought you into the discipline in the first place, <laughs> becoming a boxer, going and living in the bush? Um, what made you say to yourself, self, this is what I want to do with my life? So we will start with you, Amelia. Your decision to become an anthropologist is, should be still fresh in your mind. What, what uh, made you do it? Um, it was actually a train trip when I was going from Paris to London when I was 19. So I went over to England for a year, didn't really want to go to uni, stuff like that. Um, and I sat, I sat next to a woman who was a Holocaust survivor. And she started telling me about her life and her experiences. And she started talking about how when she was young, because she was quite young when the Holocaust, when World War II um, came back and she lost a lot of family members, um, she could never understand why her family was being picked on, like why her family was being persecuted. And she was like, it was just my culture. I didn't know anything different. So I started telling her and I was like, oh, I'm thinking about doing anthropology. And she told me, if you have the ability to do something good, if you're, you have the ability to make a difference, you need to do it. Um, so that's kind of why I chose it, which was this conversation on a train for two hours, uh, Paris to London. And it just stayed with me. Right. Annie, I know you have to leave. Maybe we'll, we'll go to you next. What, well, what I, brought you to anthropology? Well, I actually started out um, when I went to university. I was going to be a maths and history teacher. And I did anthropology as a fourth subject because my history teacher told me that she thought I'd like anthropology. Um, she said, you won't like psychology. Scratch that off. Do anthropology instead. And I did anthropology and I dropped history and I dropped maths and I dropped French and I just went on and did anthropology because it was all about people. It was absolutely fascinating. And although I started my life as more about archaeology, as, as I've... It, it, as, as my life progressed, I recognised that archaeology is about living people just as much as it's about dead people. And I became more and more interested in the way in which Aboriginal people related to place. And so I now actually call myself a social archaeologist because I still do archaeology, but I do anthropology as well. And so I'm, I work right at that intersection between the two as, as a cultural heritage manager. Mm. Uh, well, for me... Um I was teaching out in a place called Arakoon in Cape York, which is a quite a large Aboriginal community of about 1,800 people. And I was trying to engage the kids who dropped out of school and who were involved in all sorts of, um, you know, negative activities, um, trying to engage them in planning for a life and getting the skills they needed to, to get jobs or... or potentially to, to work in the community or to work in the broader society. And um, it was very challenging, as you can imagine. And um, I found it troubling because I thought, you know, there's these people living out in the bush and the, the kind of broader economy of 
you know, wage work and career was hard to imagine in that place, which is a very remote place with, with not much infrastructure and so on, and, and not much real economy, not, you know, not many, not much business. And, and I found it troubling and I found it really confronting and I thought, you know, I need to get to the bottom of, of how these places um, ended up here and how the kind of vexed colonial history of Australia's engagements across cultures and, and the experience of, of Indigenous people and the dispossession from the land you know how that how that happened and and how we might be able to think beyond that and sort of I still find that very troubling and very challenging so that's anthropology has sort of given me a way to ask the question I guess mm. now they're coming thick and thin I know you have to leave <laughs> you'll stay for a bit, longer. Stay for a bit yeah. longer um Miss Tomasla has just come in with a whole bunch of questions uh -huh. um I think let's just pick up one one or two um one is about um, she noticed that we use different names for indigenous people in Australia, Aboriginal, particular group names, blackfellas. Um, maybe, yeah, do you want to, I, I understand indigenous people is a very generic term um, that we use around the world. In Australia, we use Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders to capture some of the diversity um, mm. because at the northern end of this state, the Torres Strait goes into Melanesian cultural uh, milieu. So do you want to very briefly the difference of usage? Are there some terms we, we use? Well Aboriginal people have different names for themselves. So in South East Queensland they're called Murrays. Mm. In New South Wales they call themselves Kurris. In Western Australia there's Noongar. In Central Australia there's Ananu. So these are sort of group names that Aboriginal people use. Quite often Aboriginal people refer to themselves as blackfellas. It's, a, it's quite a common term that you hear. Um, they call white people different names as well. And this, around this part of the world, they're Migaloos. Um, up in the Northern Territory, they're Balanda. Um, so again, they, these are names that Aboriginal people use. And so I guess those of us who work with Aboriginal people use the names that our Aboriginal colleagues mm. use. And, and one related to that is, do many Indigenous people in Australia identify themselves as Australians as well? Well, I guess one of the interesting things about indigeneity thinking about it conceptually and as a potentiality, as Elizabeth Povinelli puts it, is it makes us think differently about the nation as well as the history of the nation. And I mean, if you think about indigenous groups on the border of Canada and the United States, um, you know, they're also questioning sovereignties mm -hmm. as well. And I think that there's always the potentiality in indigeneity to question what Australia is. And, you know, if you start to think about indigenous people on the Torres Strait who can see Papua New Guinea, you know. And move across that and, border. Yeah, move across, you know, fairly loosely, although there are restrictions on them then coming back through into, into mainland Australia. But it's a potentiality in a way of thinking differently about the space of the nation state and the time of the nation state, the history and so on. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, out in the Gulf country, uh, people, people certainly, lots of people see themselves as, as passionately Australian and as committed to the goals and the, and the future of, of this country and its government, the Commonwealth, as, um, you know, as anybody else does. And, and one question that's actually really interesting around the power of labels, because in lots of countries, indigeneity brings with, us, brings with it either positive or negative discrimination. Um, so the question is, are labels exacerbating differences in power structures, or are they necessary for comparison and cultural analysis? That's a really good question. <laughs> Wow. Um, I think labels are problematic. Like that's like especially if it's a label imposed upon someone else that's racist or discriminatory, or just degrades people. I think that's incredibly problematic. And um, but I, I think it's also when you work as an anthropologist, you get an amazing opportunity to talk with people and find out how they want to. What do they want to be called? What 
what do the aunts and uncles that I work with want, like how, do they want to be called Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? Uh, would they prefer Murray? Would they prefer Guri? Um, do they, their own country? Like it's, so as an anthropologist, I, I'm in this really lucky position that I can ask the people I work with, well, what, what would you like? And I can show them my work and be like, this is what I've done. What do you think? Can we have a yarn about it? Can we have a bit of a chat and like discuss about what you think about my research? Because I want your feedback. And in terms of the, the, the labels, um, again, we, we, we're entering that realm where politics and the legal system imposes certain mm -hmm. labels. But as you said, people also self-ascribe labels. Mm. And as I understand in Australia, uh, to be deemed Aboriginal, you have to be accepted into a group. How does that process work and how, do, how, how does one engage it in, in, in some respect? Well, I guess in, in the work of Tim Rowles, who's an Australian historian and anthropologist, he distinguishes between Indigenous peoples and Indigenous populations. And when we think of, of Indigenous, the label Indigenous, it, it maps both of those things. And one of those things is, is a political potentiality, um, you know, a, a Murray history and, and identity or a Gungalita nation or Wanyu nation and so on out in the bush. But the other thing, the population, is something that becomes visible through the processes of the state and through the forms of recognition and census collecting and, and interviewing and, uh, and the ways in which that, that those people appear you know, statistically and, mm -hmm. and, and appear as different and then are dealt with as different through the Australian uh, legal system and, and, you know, epidemiological responses and so mm -hmm. on. Um, and so those two things are overlapping and they're different and, and um, you know, there are some tensions between them as well because when we think about how people might want to use labels and, and what those labels might conceal, like differences mm. between people in the city and out in the bush and what they may make possible in terms of funding and in terms of, um, you know, treaty and settler reconciliation responses and so on to the large population of Aboriginal people. So, yeah, there's lots to think with about labels. And I think it's also labels... Like recently, a PhD student who's just graduated, Dr. So Sophie Hickey, she's done a whole PhD on what does it mean to use labels in health, uh, especially when referring to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And she's done amazing work on like the problematic notion of a label, uh, particularly in institutions, in health as a statistic. Um, and what does that mean? And I guess the role of anthropology, again, is to, to question mm -hmm. the labels, the essentializing that often comes mm -hmm from labels. I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave you to have the, had the last word um, and we'll draw this live uh, discussion to an end. Thank you so much for being part of it and thank you all for being part of it. Um, I hope we've answered all your questions. Uh, if we haven't, there's always a discussion forum to delve back into. Uh, there were lots of other issues we wanted to cover. Um, I didn't get to say why I got into anthropology. I'll say that in the next live feed. <laughs> so thank you very much and see you back in the course.